Right, people, we need to talk about Erling Haaland. How bad is Erling Haaland? It, that is a sentence I did not think I was going to be saying this season, and especially for someone who has scored goals this year. But in this video, we're going to talk about the debate that's out there right now. You know, Is he a good footballer? Is he falling off a little bit? Why is he struggling? I've got answers to that in terms of my opinion on it. What's missing this year? And when it comes to the Ballon d'Or, is he capable of winning the Ballon d'Or? And if he is to win it, how does he win it? Because he was in that conversation with Mbappe, and I think he still could come back to that. But it's actually, when we looked into it, it was far more muddy than we thought, and actually a bit more damning on Haaland than I thought as well. Very, very interesting one. Let's get straight into it, because I want to focus on the game last night. The Real Madrid uh, game where... People started to talk about him because he got taken off. And actually, the first thing to say is, of course, Pep Guardiola took him off, at, you know, and, and he didn't play an extra time. Now, for him to come off, that just seems wild, doesn't it? If you think of, you know, the 18 months that he's had. He came off, De Bruyne came off, Akanji came off. And importantly, Pep said that they asked to come off. Now, this is a bit of a bravado tangent, but that better be true. Because if it's not, if I'm Haaland or De Bruyne or Akanji, free kind of, you know, obviously Haaland's young, but senior pros, I'm fuming at Pep Guardiola putting that out there. So for them to want to come off is interesting, but it might just be as simple as that and it was an injury or whatever, or exhaustion, who knows, and they came off. But I thought that was interesting and not something I expected to hear. Let's get to the game because actually what it's getting, in terms of him getting hammered for this game in particular, he does a lot of things that great strikers do. And I think he is... He's a very good striker. Is he well-rounded? We'll get to that. So this is a moment in the 18th minute. And I just want to highlight that like, often he is dealing with a, l a lack of uh, space. But when he has those little bits of space, I think his movement is phenomenal, right? And in this little passage of play, he actually moves one way, then another way, then another way to get into himself into a really good area. Let's move it along. So there's his starting position. Initially, it's been a bit of play here into play here. De Bruyne is about to get in and he's going to want to put a cross in. And my point will be with this is that sometimes it's got to fall for you. But are you doing the right things? You can see there. So initial movement left, then movement right to go in front of Rudiger. Rudiger has no clue what's going on whatsoever by this point. And then he makes another third movement back the other way. And if De Bruyne is able to find him, if De Bruyne is able to find him here, then it's a goal. It's a tap in. It's great forward play. It's great forward movement from him. Unfortunately, he's unable to do that. Let's just get to that point here. Here you go. The cross comes in and... Another thing that's important to say with this is the defending and the reading of it is absolutely brilliant. Rudiger, despite all the difficulties with the movement from Haaland in that moment, he is there to, to cut it out. But also Lunin as well, who is unorthodox to say the very least. He does brilliantly, so brave and calls his bluff, I guess, calls the cross, reads it. and But if it made its way through, of course, he would have had a tap in. 80 minutes gone, Haaland's, you know, scoring. Life's great, right? doesn't happen the game progresses literally this is in the exact same moment and again it's not all luck because it's not as simple as that and Pep Guardiola doesn't believe in luck so but as the game progresses he then in the same moment he is now in the goal he's making his way back into a different area and when he then has a header which is another chance again he's a little bit unfortunate right because if we move it along he has the header. His body weight is going in the opposite direction, which I think is worth remembering. And he's also being challenged by Valverde. And the ball smacks the crossbar. Very, very difficult for him. The problem for me with him when it comes to the link-up play is he can't be involved. He just can't be involved. Let me explain what I mean. Because if we move it along, this is a good side of the link-up play from Haaland. But Haaland can only do that when he has space. I don't think he can do it when it's when a team is playing in a low block. Let me explain exactly why. So this is the moment where he gets, he starts here, steps into this area here, very tight with his, op, with his um, midfielders there. And actually you generally expect him to be making those runs, but he wants to get involved and affect the game. And he does exactly that. He picks up the ball. He's obviously aware. He knows he can turn and he knows he can attack he knows he can attack the space here. And he does exactly that. This is devastating link-up play. 
takes out one, two, three, four, if we're honest, and in terms of being behind the ball and compact, he takes out so many players here. And as you move it on, he's able to draw in Carvajal and he actually plays a pass into Grealish, who then gets himself a shot off. That's really good hold-up play. That's pretty devastating stuff. But it's when there's space. That's when he is good. That's when he's world-class. And if you think of Borussia Dortmund, it would be pop it off and spin. There was space in behind a lot of the time. He's devastating in the box as well. And we'll get to that. But there is a problem here. Let's move the other way. Because the problem he has in another side of the link-up play is this. And I'll show you on the tactics board as well because I think it's really important. This is how they set up, right? You've always got you guys at the back. You've got Rodri looking to get involved. And we'll show in, the, in a perfect scenario, of course, you'd have stones in this. But what you know is going to happen is that these two players are going to stay wide. And at the moment, you've got Foden. You've got De Bruyne in central areas. You've even got a Kanji up there for this game. Of course, Stones wasn't totally fit. But the ball is actually here. Because they're switching the play. I think it's Rodri on this occasion. Switching the play, using the, the width of the pitch. And from there, Doku's going to get down the line. Or he's going to go one-on-one. -on -one, and he's going to look to you know hurt them f via that. And Grealish does a similar thing. So in terms of the hold-up play, what is he supposed to do? I, I, like, let's go to the tax board because I think this will explain it a little better because there's like what is honestly someone explain to me what he is supposed to do because if we bring in a at, you know that's a general setup right in terms of how they would like to, to, to set up right and Akanji comes and gets involved as well but when you make it congested centre backs let's look at Arsenal and how they would set up this is how Arsenal would probably set up right it would be compact they would have Two four, two banks of four generally. They'd be concerned about Foden and De Bruyne. Martinelli and Saka would be back in. And then you'd have Odegaard and you'd have Havertz dropping in as well. It'd be like that, most likely, right? So what is Haaland supposed to do in terms of hold-up play and link-up play? Do you think Pep Guardiola would like it if he came and got involved here? No. Do you think he'd like it if he came and got involved here? No. And when he's standing here, how would you feel if Rodri tried to play through all of these guys and play it into Haaland here? It's just not going to happen. It, it would be silly to do that. So when you're having a go at him and his hold-up play, in terms of passes and stats like that, it's a nonsense because the whole game, there's so many bodies here. And Haaland is the last that should be getting involved because he has to be in the penalty area. Both to keep these two centre-backs honest, but to also be ready for those chances when they come. And that's, that's a very difficult thing when it comes to link-up play for him. In terms of scoring goals, though, I do think it's got a little bit monotonous when it comes to his movement. And I think it's for a very, very clear reason, in my opinion. It's the, the link-up with Kevin De Bruyne. We go back to the game last night. When you've got Doku on the ball here, let's see if I can find the right one. So from Doku, from this point, there's that pass across to him. He gets to the byline and he gets a cross in. Okay, and This might even be the goal. The goal maybe comes from this and maybe drops to um, De Bruyne. So, you know, in terms of helping the team, there's something there. But what's important here is Erling Haaland. Erling Haaland is at the back post. And he always goes to the back post because he's very dominant. He's tall. You'll see Chris Wood do that. Crouchy did that. All, all those big men will go to the back post a lot of the time. I think it's become a little bit predictable. But I also think when you've got players like Doku and Grealish, you're going to struggle to find him. How on earth are you going to get the ball to him? And from this moment, you see he drills it, comes off Rudiger. And I think this is the goal. That's where they're able to get the goal. But Haaland, of course, not involved in that moment. Let's try it. Let's keep it moving. This is a moment prior to that with Grealish. And Grealish has got the ball. Grealish is going to get wide. And interestingly, Haaland's position here, you can see from where he's looking. If I'd be able to zoom in. But you can see he's already looking at that back post. Let's get rid of that. And you can see it. Again, where does he end up? You bloody guessed it. Back post. Grealish has a shot. But he's not really even looking for Haaland. Foden possibly might be an option, but for Haaland to get the goals that he wants to score, it's very, very difficult for him to get on the ball. And that 
is a problem. Why is he not making more diverse runs when the ball is getting into the penalty box? But it's, it comes back to kind of the, the system at play. Um, and I think one thing in particular, which is Kevin De Bruyne. 16 assists to Haaland last season from Kevin De Bruyne. Eight in the Premier League. And when I was looking at this and you're looking at his position on the pitch, the thing that's sort of screaming out for him has been one, sp one specific pass for me. And I'll show you it here. And we saw it time and again. Whilst I was chatting to the guys and we were talking about how we're going to put this video together, I was saying the thing is that the reason why he was so devastating last year was that you've got De Bruyne who's here right now. Haaland loves him here and he loves him here to put in those lofted crosses to that back stick. There was just so much joy from that. And even if he's out here, right? Lofted pass to the back post. That's how they hurt the opposition. And I'll show you that one. These are just four examples. And the crosses were always lofted crosses. Constantly beautiful lofted crosses from Kevin De Bruyne to Erling Haaland in the air. And he was able to go and attack them. <laughs> Move it on. These are just four that we found really easily as soon as we started watching it. It's a similar thing. It's across to the back post. Haaland being on the blind side, being dominant and scoring from those opportunities. Same again. We'll move it on. Same thing. He lofts it. Back post in the air. And he scores. And again, <laughs> it's another one. You can see the cross here. You can see Haaland ready for it, ready to pounce. But if you think about the, uh, the areas of which he's getting the ball at the moment or where the crosses are coming in from, that's hurting him because he's at the back post and it's, it's pointless. Whereas when he's got De Bruyne with him, he scores more goals. De Bruyne has not obviously been in the team all season long. And I think that has been a bit of a problem when it comes to, to Haaland. So what needs to happen? I think the movement needs to change. I think he needs to think about getting into central areas a little bit more. And actually, there's another bit of a bit of a different thought here. But is he rubbish? Is he struggling? I think his confidence is low. And what was amazing when I looked at Stathead, and again, to getting a picture of a player and what they're doing, Stathead is the one, baby. Link in the description. If you want to get Stathead, it's aligned, obviously, with FB Ref. You're able to make custom databases that work for you or custom tables from their database, forgive me. But with Haaland here, it's not a surprise to know what he is as a player. You know, tackles, interceptions, blocks. He's not getting involved with that passage of play. I've explained that. Passes attempt, attempted. He's in the bottom 4% in the top five leagues. It says it all. Progressive passes. He doesn't play them because he doesn't go in and get involved in that. Okay, we know that. His finishing and his movement, that is something that he needs to be served in a different way because what they need to get ready for is when Kevin De Bruyne is not available anymore because that is going to be a problem because Haaland is what he is. And he's going to continue to be dominant. Can he become more well-rounded? Yeah, but it's binary. It's always very, very binary when it comes to Haaland. He scored so many goals last season. Aesthetically, he is dominant, but not, you know, doesn't really have real grace to himself. And he created a bit of a rod for his own back when you look, when you look at last season. And what's really interesting here is when it comes to the goals per season and his XG and how he's, um, how he's working with that, if we go down... You can see here, this is, if we go to non-penalty XG minus, uh, sorry, non-penalty goals minus XG. Look at that. This season is, one, he's been running hot. But if you look at last season, he was naught, he was plus six, which shows quality, but it also shows he was taking his chances. And it also shows that those chances that were being created for him were fantastic chances this season is it an anomaly we'll see with time but in comparison to his seasons at Dortmund it is the worst by a long way Not a minus 3.7 in terms of his xg it's really really poor really really poor mind-blowingly poor but then when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, okay, what about him from a Man City point of view? Because I think the thing to remember here as well, I mean, that's damning in itself. That's not good enough. It's the best. These, Man City is essentially the best team in the world and he's getting good chances. So he's got to be scoring them. But how does it rank up against the other Man City players of the past? Well, we've got that through Stathead. 
right here, right now. You're just you're not capable of doing this anywhere else. So please go check out Stathead. Like we're so chuffed to be supported by them. So this is non-penalty XG two shots. And so when it comes to the two seasons, the thing I want to highlight here when it comes to Haaland, hopefully I get this right. Yeah. These are the two seasons for him. And this is per 90 because I think that's important as well because we've got the end of, we haven't got to the end of the season yet. In terms of shots per non-penalty XG, he's at 0.20, 0.20. So the chances he's getting the chances he's getting are as good Maybe it's a different style of chance, but according to general feelings around football and XG, the chances that he's getting per shot are as good last season as they were this season. Take that in. So when he's underperforming his XG that badly, there is no way around it. He is having a poor season with the chances that he's got. The style of chances without Kevin De Bruyne, is that the reason behind the drop off? Very possibly. Also, you know, that first season, people don't know about him. Go back and watch the first goal that he scores for West Ham. West Ham, right? Who we know play deep. They don't really know enough. And so there's a goal where De Bruyne has all this space in front of him and he plays Haaland in behind. That just doesn't happen anymore. But in comparison to every Man City forward over the years, the important thing here is goals per 90, I think. That's what he's going to be known of. As I said, binary. It's always binary with him. And when the non-penalty XG per shot is the same last season to this season, you can see the drop-off between him, 1.2 to 0.8. But the other side of it is his amount of goals per game is still in the top it's still in the top four seasons for a striker for Man City. Is it easier because it's Man City and they're dominant? Maybe, but Man City have been dominant for a very, very long time. Very, very long time. So let's come back to this final question, which I think is really uh, interesting. First of all, is he is he a great footballer? I think he's a phenomenal striker. Put him anywhere else on the pitch, he's probably not good enough. Does that matter? Does that make him less valuable? No, because he scores goals. That's what he's about. How do you solve the problem? I think that's an interesting one as well, right? And then we'll finish with the Ballon d'Or comment. How does he win the Ballon d'Or? With Haaland and De Bruyne running out of time, there needs to be a new person to create that cross, to make that pass for him. How will that come? That's going to come through personnel. But that is where he's so dominant when it's congested. And in terms of him getting involved in the play, like, let that go. That's not him. That's not what he's about. He has to be a bully and he has to score goals. And that as an opportunity to score goals with the amount of assists that De Bruyne provides and the pass appreciation that he has, that needs to be created in one of two ways. And then, of course, the other thing is that don't always go to the back post. Be a fox in the box at the front post, which we've seen from that very first clip at the start of the video. He has that in him. So with De Bruyne moving over time how will it change will they go back to a back four and you can get crosses from a fullback who would that fullback be or is there another midfielder that can come and get involved or if you're going to stay in this way is there another way of doing it the other way of doing it if you are going to continue to play this way where you get down the sides and you're having pullbacks but you're still going to want to be able to be dominant in the air at times which it seems to be a, a thing for pep when he's got these big big players that he's, he's um, accumulated over the years the interesting thing for me is the idea of instead of having and allowing Foden to have that freedom, maybe. But as De Bruyne gets older and maybe you don't utilize him as much, is it one where you actually have a second threat in the box? And but when I say that, I mean someone who's a little bit more physical than someone like Alvarez. And the reason for that would be that if the ball comes over to this side and if there is a concern that the cross is going to go to the back post, does it always have to be Haaland? I think it's just a little bit predictable with Haaland at the moment because out of those attacking players, he's the guy, you know, he's the big guy who's going to stay in the middle. So in terms of having someone who could maybe drop in and help a little bit to do a bit of that De Bruyne work, maybe a fullback who's got more crossing ability, but also a player here who can come and be that second threat. 
that second threat could be the back post guy. And then all of a sudden you've got Haaland at the front post or Haaland waiting here, Haaland working in these spaces instead of always going to the back post back post which at the moment when we switch it around and we have Doku and him getting those crosses in and Man City do often focus down that left hand side it's just too difficult there's too many bodies and there's not enough finesse on the chances that are being created for someone who is uh, just a little bit one dimensional final comment then Ballon d'Or how does he win it I actually tried to figure this I worked it out I'll come back to that word binary Haaland is a binary footballer. He will be judged on goals and goals alone for the rest of his season because he's not being involved in the link-up play. He needs to take his chances. His conversion rate is the worst it's ever been in his career. And so for him to win the Ballon d'Or, it's going to have to be about binary domination. You know? And so, especially with Norway, look, Norway have got a bit of a golden generation right now. And so could they go and win a Euros or a World Cup? Maybe. I doubt it. So he's not going to win the Ballon d'Or in a Euros or a World Cup because generally we've seen as over the years that it's those other players that end up winning it. And so he needs to win a Champions League and score 50 goals to win the Ballon d'Or. It's as simple as that because he's a great footballer, but he's not brilliant at football, but he's devastating. All three of those things can be true. Do you agree with me? Let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and go and check out all the content on the channel. Why not?